Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, this is Samantha Shannon. <laughs> um, yeah, so for everyone on the call, can you please um, mute yourself for the duration of the conversation? And we're going to uh, keep comments to the chat um, so we can have a nice, lovely discussion. And yeah, just as an introduction, this is Samantha Shannon. Samantha, thank you so, so much for joining uh, our little Safflet um, monthly book discussion for Priory of the Orange Tree. For those of you who don't know um, about Samantha, she is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author. She was born in West London and started writing in abundance when she was 12. She studied English language and literature at St. Anne's College in Oxford, specializing in the poetry of Emily Dickinson and the principles of film criticism. And then at the age of 21, she published the first uh, installment of The Bone Season, which is going to be a seven book series of fantasy novels. And she now has four books out in that series now. And in 2019, of course, she published The Priory of the Orange Tree, which is a sapphic fantasy full of dragons and for everyone who read it you know how amazing this book is with the four perspectives of the storytellers and the love story between Eid and Sabrin and I'm just beyond honored and excited to have her here today with us to ask her all of the questions that have been building up in my head for the past month so everyone say thank you for Samantha for joining us and yeah we can get started um, so Samantha, if you don't know, um, we kind of stumbled into reading Priory oh, as an accident. Um, so I posted a video on TikTok that we were, you know, deciding on our next book and someone, Bo, I don't know if Bo is on the call here, but Bo commented on that. I dare you to pick Priory of the Orange Tree as our next book. <laughs> Yes, Bo. Bo Mathis is in the chat saying it's you. Um, and Thank you, Bo. <laughs> and that comment got a lot of attention and people were liking it, being like, oh my God, I dare you, I dare you. And you know what? I put it in the poll and to everyone's surprise, um, Priory kept picking up more and more votes. I think, of course, as we discussed before, everyone jumped on. A lot of people are intimidated by its size. But yeah. it ended up winning um, the poll by nine votes. And right. we, we read Priory for the month of July. And it was such a beautiful reading experience because of the collective joy and effort and determination everyone had when tackling this behemoth of a book. So my first question is kind of in two parts for you. Um, do you think Priory's size contributed to its popularity on TikTok besides the masterful writing, of course? And do you think reading it in a collective setting like a book club like ours um, can benefit the reading experience since it can be kind of intimidating to take on alone? Um, yeah, thank you so much, first of all, to everyone for having me. I don't think I've actually done like a specifically queer sapphic book club before. So it's really nice to kind of be hanging out with you guys. Um, in terms of the size, uh, I was very nervous about the size when I wrote it because the main reason that it's so big is because it is a standalone. I wanted to write a self-contained story where the reader could just go all the way through it and you didn't have to wait for the next installment because like you said I'm, I have another ongoing series that's really long it's seven books and I just thought like wouldn't it be nice if you could just read the whole thing in one go because there are so many duologies and trilogies nowadays and actually sometimes I think that splitting it can almost create filler like sometimes the book just doesn't need to be split into three but a publisher might say oh you know we need you to add two more installments to this and sometimes you can really feel that especially in middle books in a series um so I just said to my agent oh what if I just took a little break to write a standalone because I'd always really wanted to reimagine the legend of Saint George and the dragon which is what Priory is it's a fundamentally a retelling of that story um, and when I handed it in, I was like, oh, this is quite big, isn't it? Because <laughs> um, my, my bone season books is sort of more in the range of maybe 120, 150,000 words, which is more normal for sort of adult fantasy. Whereas this one ended up at, I think the first draft was like 290,000 words, which is a lot. Um, but I was lucky that Bloomsbury were not 
you know too concerned about it they have done really big fantasies before like they did Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell that kind of thing um and to my surprise instead of being uh sort of it did put a lot of people off I won't lie it does worry me sometimes because I think that people might think it's inaccessible and that they're gonna um there's like various reasons that people might be put off by a book of that size um but I remember when it started to become almost a selling point for it, like a talking point, certainly, which was at Book Expo when they handed out the early um, advanced reading copies of it to bloggers and uh, sort of publishing people, that sort of thing. And I remember that people were getting stopped at the airport coming back from New York because people had this huge block of like suspicious looking organic matter in their bags. <laughs> So I think they thought they were smuggling drugs or something. Um, and people were saying like, I, is anybody else getting stopped at the airport? <laughs> because of like, is anyone being stopped at JFK with this giant book in their back? Um, so that became kind of a talking point. And then I didn't really know about TikTok because I'm, I'm nearly 30 and I sort of always assumed that everyone on TikTok's like 60 and I was just going to be mutton drunk <laughs> lamb if I try going on there. Like a lot of authors are having this conversation. I think we're like, are we cool enough for TikTok? Because fundamentally, I feel like a lot of authors are really nervous and we're like oh I don't know if we can hang out with you know the teenagers and look cool and not just like we're trying to sell you something like I would hate to go on there and you know just look as if I'm trying to sell my books I want to always try to be really authentic with my social media and only do it if I really enjoy it mm -hmm. so initially because I actually hate being on camera I just don't think I have a very photogenic face unfortunately mm -hmm. so I just was like oh god is it all just going to be like on TikTok you just have to film your own face all the time that's going to be really uncomfortable but I thought I would try it because everyone was talking about how great and fun it was and I've just left Twitter recently. So I thought I would, you know, sort of pick up another social media maybe. And I was really surprised that like when I when I went on there, my little brother's a teenager and he was like, yeah, go on, like make an introduction video, it'd be great. And I made an introduction, just a quick introduction being like, oh, you know, hi, I'm Samantha Shannon. I wrote this book and that book, blah, blah, blah. And it got like loads of views. And everyone was like, oh, I love Priory. And it's, uh, you know, this is really exciting. And I was just quite astonished that anyone even knew what Priory was on there. I wasn't really expecting it to be known at all. Because I'm not like, I'm not a especially well-known author compared to other people. So I wasn't like, you know, expecting anything. And I got this really huge warm welcome. And a lot of the videos I was seeing about Priory were about its absurd size. And, you know, people being like, oh, I've heard this is great, but you guys didn't tell me that you could kill a whale with it, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so it, it has been really interesting to see that as a talking point and that actually I do, I do get that it puts people off and it is a bit risky. But then I see people reading like Brandon Sanderson and George R. R. Martin as well. And sometimes I'm like, you know what, I think that women should be able to take up space the way male epic fantasy authors do. And I'm not you know, I don't feel bad about that. I feel like that was as long as it needed to be. I don't think there's any sort of filler in it. Um, regarding the question with like whether I think it's a good idea to tackle it as a community, I think that's a great way to get through it because you know if you give yourself like reading targets and stuff. Like I, I read a book with my friend recently, and it was basically the size of a pamphlet, so not the same thing, but it was really nice to talk to her about it afterwards and to, to discuss it. And so yeah, I think that's great. I think it's a really good idea to tackle books as a book club, and especially when you can all encourage each other to power through this ridiculous whale-sized book. <laughs> Um, it's funny that you say you think you're too old to be on TikTok because I thought I'm 23 and I thought I was too old to be on oh, TikTok. Oh, you're not too old. <laughs> I, know, I know. Now I feel like a lot more comfortable with it. But when I first heard of it and people were telling me to get on it, I was like, it's full of 14 year olds. Like, I don't know how to talk to 14 year olds. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but definitely have made my way since then. And I remember, so I read Priory in my, I'm in my parents' house right now. And I read Priory in five days when I was oh, wow. here um, over July 4th weekend. And I would just tackle like a part a day, basically in the beginning of the morning, um, since I wake up at like 6am and my grandmother was here with us and she was like, what the fuck are you reading? And I handed it to her and she was like, this is a blunt murder weapon. Like what this is, is a blunt force object. And I was like, mm -hmm. she's like, I could never do that. Um, bless her. She's 93, but she, she loves <laughs> Oh, bless um, Yeah. So my next question is, so you mentioned Priory is historical fantasy, of course, a retelling of St. George and the Dragon, but very much rooted in historical research um, of Japan, Elizabethan England, like folklore in um, many different parts of the world. So my question is, do you think that feminist retellings of history is inherently more powerful than a feminist alternate universe fantasy because it allows the reader to like reimagine and challenge the misogynist sexist past. 
Yeah, it's interesting just to see how writers deal with feminism within a fantasy context generally. And I have spoken about this at length before because I find it a very interesting topic. And you'll get a fantasy that's something like Game of Thrones, for example, which is the example I normally use as kind of the opposite of what I do. So what you see Martin doing is he's kind of trying to reflect what he perceives as actual medieval sexism, I think. And then you see a character like Daenerys overcoming that. And it's that's a, a way that he's trying to create an empowering feminist story by having the character overcome, you know, what, you know, real world sexism in a, an alternate universe, essentially. Um, with mine, I, I started writing Priory and it was, it, it was an interesting concept because I was trying to challenge a sexist narrative without propagating that sexism in my own work. Um, so I had to try to think of ways to comment on patriarchy without it necessarily being a, a strongly patriarchal setting. Because whenever I typed out, you know, oh, you can't lift a sword, you're a woman. And I was like, oh, I just feel like I've seen that so many times. And I'm just kind of bored of it at this point. Like, I think there are some great stories that do that. And I completely understand why authors do it. Like often, especially if it's a female author, I feel like they're working through something they might have actually experienced. But for me, I was just... I just wanted to not do that. I just wanted it to be not surprising if a woman was a knight or that kind of thing. Um, so when I was approaching George and the Dragon, I decided to have it so that the George type character had founded a kingdom, but then it was a kingdom that just was of queens. So there, they it isn't. It, they made no sense for it to be a sexist kingdom because or queendom because all of the rulers had been women. So there's absolutely no reason for it to be sexist. But I liked the idea that all of these queens would be essentially forced into telling a dead man's story and propagating his narrative and having to use their bodies and all of them being pregnant and sort of having to continue this line. Um, so that was that was an interesting thing to do. But yeah, I think it, I think it can be powerful to do both in terms of like a complete alternate universe. You're, you have an opportunity to create what the world could be which I think is really exciting. And I think sci-fi and fantasy authors have a great place in showing, you know, stuff doesn't have to be like this. Like this is what a completely non-sexist world would look like. Um, but yeah, in terms of, I think retelling history can be powerful as well. Like whether you're doing something like what Martin is doing or, or whether you're just reimagining history without the sexism, I think that can be quite a, a bold thing to do as well. Amazing. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned um, Game of Thrones because that kind of um, leads into my next question. And content warning, um, this question is going to mention rape and sexual assault. So if you're uncomfortable with that, you can uh, turn the sound off and I can give like a little hand raise when we're done with this question. So um, how do you feel about Priory being called the feminist version of Game of Thrones? Um, I read your article in Miss Magazine where you discussed how Game of Thrones fans defended Sansa Stark's uh, rape by calling it historically accurate. Um, mm -hmm. to the time period, yet the world is full of dragons, which are obviously inaccurate and complete fantasy. So how do you feel about that comparison? Um, I think it's probably meant kindly. I think, I think it, publishing in general just compares everything to everything else. It's just a, a marketing tactic. So for example, when I, was, uh, when I was a debut author, my book, The Bone Season, kept getting compared to Harry Potter. And really the only reason for that was because it's a seven book series. JK Rowling and I are both British and are both published by Bloomsbury. I don't think there was really any other similarity between them. Um, but the whole time it was like, oh, you're the next JK Rowling and your book's the next Harry Potter. And it was just like, it's not, but it's just, people just seem to like reaching for something familiar rather than, you know, it's just, it's just a thing that happens in publishing. So I get why it would be compared to Game of Thrones. I think George and I are, George, I'm acting like he's like a personal friend of mine. Um, Martin <laughs> and I are sort of doing similar things. There's dragons. It's an obvious comparison. What's the most recent dragon thing people think of? It's got to be Game of Thrones. Um, it's been compared to Tolkien as well because, you know, again, dragons, epic fantasy. I don't think any of these books are particularly similar to one another, but it's just something that people do in publishing. Um, I think he and I definitely approach feminism and women in a very different way. Um, like I said, I think he's, he's drawing on almost like stereotypical ideas of the medieval era I think like because because for example child marriage in the medieval era was not actually as common as we think it is but he often goes towards that um, to show the extreme sexism and kind of violence and brutality of his worlds and I think Martin is he does grimdark a lot like I think he is kind of responsible in a way for the very heavy emphasis on grimdark we've had in fantasy in the last few years 
Um, and I think that's fine. I, th I think he's a great world builder and I think he's very good at building character, etc. But it just wasn't the route I personally wanted to go down. I, what I said in the Ms. Magazine article is I think it is very important for there to be books that do explore rape and sexual assault and other difficult topics because you want people who survive that to be able to have a mirror. If you don't talk about that, it becomes stigmatized and taboo and you, you don't want to say to people, oh, what's happened to you is so terrible that I can't ever show it in fiction. The issue I have is with the expectation of that in fantasy and the idea that it's somehow noteworthy if we don't include rape and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And with, I mean, with Sansa Stark, I thought that was absurd. I mean, it was, to me, I could see why people were complaining about that scene because it was actually invented for the show. It's not even that she, you know, she doesn't have that happen to her in the book. But it was just, it just, I can see why people were complaining about it, but then there was this backlash, like, oh, that's just what happened to women back in the day. It's like, right, but it is a fantasy. You don't have to show that. And you don't, you don't even have to show that in historical fiction, because you get to the point where women would be unable to read historical or fantasy without confronting that. And for me, I think that's really problematic. So I just wanted Priory to be something different to that and to offer a place. And I try to do this in my Bone Season series as well, which is sort of a futuristic dystopian fantasy. Um, I just try to have it so that women aren't under that constant threat and it just to just have that safe space where you don't have that happen. I mean, lots of other awful stuff happens, but I just don't like the expectation of it in fantasy and the idea that a book is inaccurate or pandering or too soft. If we don't include that, I just find it a little bit difficult, that idea. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I personally read all of Game of Thrones, um, which is why the comparison where it's like, oh, Priory so huge. I'm like, Game of Thrones are like 1200 pages. That's huge. <laughs> huge. Um, and I watched the entire TV show as well, of course. And, you know, that scene was so shocking to me because it kind of reminded me of like the Revenant. Um, see, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's yeah. including scenes like that just for the shock value of it where it doesn't advance any plot or character development. It's just like, so it can be on screen and like be of shock value and of entertainment. Um, and that definitely really bothered me with the show retelling of it. Yeah, it was difficult because I felt like they had backed Sansa into a corner and if that hadn't happened, it would make it seem like she had plot armor because they put her so close to Ramsay and we know what Ramsay is like, we know what this character is like and I felt that they, they obviously felt like they'd been pushed that they sort of had to do that, otherwise it would seem like Sansa was invincible, but I just didn't love that they maneuvered her into that situation. It re I really didn't love that the whole focus was on Theon's face the entire time. I mean, what was that about? I suppose, I suppose, I suppose the idea was that they, they didn't want to show it in detail. And again, I did appreciate that. But also having Theon's reaction to it be the main thing yeah. was really, was a bit like, oh, I don't know, that whole scene was just a, a total mess for me. Yeah. Um, they they but, really fucked up the show. We don't have yeah, to get- That, that would be a whole different conversation, yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah. Sorry. Um. Okay, so we are done talking about that topic. Um. So can you discuss your decision to make Sabrin and Eve's love affair controversial in the kingdom because they weren't married versus over because they're queer? I personally love reading queer stories where the narratives aren't centered around coming out or homophobia because while those stories are really important to tell, they seem to dominate popular media culture and those tropes, in my opinion, inherently other queerness by distinguishing it as not the norm um, where like this narrative is centered around everyone else reacting to their queerness versus the character exploring and celebrating their own queerness so I'm sure this was such an intentional decision for you and kind of like relating to not being an explicitly sexist society so can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think with fantasy, I think that the reason that you often get things like sexism, homophobia, racism, is because people basically take so much inspiration from history in fantasy. And I think people always assume that throughout history, you know, it has been racist and homophobic and sexist, and therefore they reflect it in that. And of course, that is true to a degree. Um, but again, like I said before, it, it would feel uncomfortable for me if every single time a queer person read a fantasy or a historical book that they were going to confront homophobia every single time because you might not want to read about that in your escapist fiction and it's difficult that 
people would suggest that you, you would have to. So I decided that for various reasons, I wasn't going to make the world of priory any of those things. Um, I don't think as a white author, I should really be tackling, you know, racism in my work. I mean, I, th there's a degree to which I think we can do that, but it's not something that I felt was my place to talk about ex expressively. And then with um, the homophobia, I just, I, I was figuring out that I was queer when I wrote Priory and I was just like, I love the forbidden love trope. So it would have been very easy for me to slip into that and to make it a very homophobic world. Um, and I just decided like, no, don't do that. Just, just make it so that there's another reason that the love story would be forbidden. So I was just like, okay, well, they're not married. And you know there's it, Sabran has to appear to be seen to be trying for an heir so that's a way that you could make it forbidden and I also tried to do that with uh, Nick Lace and Janart's story as well like again Janart is married they were having an extramarital affair it's more to do with religion and the customs of this world rather than it being to do with them being queer um yeah and I just I, I just wanted to give queer people a safe space in which they could read this fantasy and not have it constantly you know this homophobia constantly pushed on you um so again I, I like you say it's very important for those books to exist I think there should be books that discuss all kinds of topics like that is fantasy is a really great way to explore real world topics I think and to reflect them and there's many many authors who've done that brilliantly uh, but yeah, I just don't think you should have to do that. And it has been really interesting to see just a few of the reviews. Mostly the reviews have been really positive in that sense. But now and again, you'll see something like, oh, this is pandering to the gays. Like, it's like, what, by just not, <laughs> by not having home? Oh, you pander to me. I will take it. I know. It always says this is pandering to women and the gays. And I'm like, oh, right. I'm pandering to myself. <laughs> it's that this is, I guess you kind of are pandering to yourself when you write a book because you can choose what happens. But I don't mind pandering to myself. That's fine. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's it really. There wasn't really a, I just, I wanted to challenge myself as well, like try to write a convincing, you know, authentic fantasy where you don't have to include all this stuff. And I hope I managed to achieve that. Yeah, well, you definitely did. Um, so you mentioned Niklas and I know you've talked about him as like one of the characters that you would have dinner with, um, one of your favorites to write. Um, but as a collective, Safflet voted Niklas our least favorite storyteller. We took a poll <laughs> with your favorite, Eid won by a landslide. Um, <laughs> Haley said, don't include me in this lies. There were many people who loved Niklas. I personally, and I think a lot of people saw what he did, and I'm not going to mention what he did, but he did the thing, and we were so mad, and we couldn't forgive him after that, but I think <laughs> another massive reason why he was voted least favorite is because we're mostly woman-loving women here, um, obviously we're a sapphic book club, um, so we inherently connect with the female characters more. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think Niklay's story and reader perception would have changed if you wrote him as a woman? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Um, I'm not sure. Like, I mean, when I wrote Nicholas, so I, I took inspiration from a few different historical figures when I wrote it. So Sabrin is quite similar to Elizabeth I, for example. Um, and the character I took inspiration from was called Cornelius de Lannoy, And he was an alchemist who basically persuaded Elizabeth I that he could make her the elixir of life. And he just took loads of money and would just, you know, and eventually he was caught and he was, you know, interrogated. Um, and I just love that. I was like, wow, what a, a bizarre idea just to have a guy who's claiming to make the elixir of life. Like, does he legitimately think he can make it or is he just tricking her in order to get loads of money? Um, so I, I decided to, I also wanted to try writing an older character because uh, in my other series, the main character is 19 and I've kind of grown up with her. And I was really interested in the idea because I often think that fantasy it is mostly told from the perspective of teenagers a lot of the time or from sort of younger adults. And I, I when I'm, you know, Nicolas' age, like 64, I want to know that there's some books out there that I can still read about myself in fantasy, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew he was going to be a controversial character because you know he's not very nice he basically does the equivalent of kicking a dog which is just you know kicking name assume the dragon which i knew was going to be unforgivable to most people as soon as i wrote it but i just put it in there anyway because i'm chaotic um <laughs> but <laughs> it's um if he was a woman that is really interesting because he i did wonder about the reaction to him being a man you know is were people going to be more forgiving because i often find that people are quite critical of female characters who are who make mistakes or perhaps tend more towards the villainous. And I sometimes feel they're harder on them than they would be on men. 
Um, but actually, people have been super hard on Nicholas. So, so um, I, I genuinely don't know how it would have been different if he was a woman. I think it could have potentially been very interesting um, because he he is so. Uh, I think people often expect female characters to be soft and likable and, you know, just not everything Nicolas isn't, basically. Um, so, yeah, it would have been interesting. It's, uh, but, yeah, he just very much came into my head as a man. Yeah. Um, I think Caliba. I don't know how you pronounce her name. Um, I think that's right. I, 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 it's, from the, it's, from, it's from the legend of St. George, so it could be okay. anything. Yeah, she's like the villainess of the story, along with the prioress as well. Um, so I think you definitely had like plenty of like antagonistic female characters in there. But um, yes. Nikes' chapters were so interesting for me to read because I, of course, like didn't really connect to them at all. Um, and then also with um, what he did to Eid on top of the dragon, whose name I definitely cannot pronounce. Um, yeah, Naima Thun. <laughs> Naima <Thun? laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a new community group um, that's an extension of Saflet that I don't know if Kenzie's here, um, but Kenzie came to me asking, can we have a Saflet group for writers? And I said, go for it. Just create it. You've got my support. So we have a Saflet writers group now. Um, I'd love for you to, this was one of the most common questions that we got when, you know, preparing for this um, from our community, your process for world building and outlining your plot. Um, so can you describe that? So your writers, so writers here can gain insight. And if you have any words of wisdom for them, like including myself, who has a concept of a book in her head and has no idea where to start. Um, yeah, just discuss that. Sure, I should probably um, like prelude this by saying that I'm like the worst writer for asking about writing advice. I'm like, oh, I just kind of do it. And it's like, I just don't know how to describe my own process half the time. Um, so when I write a book, I normally write a synopsis and I just basically just try to follow it as much as I can. I think some authors have like this, you know, like the three act structure and all this other stuff. I never really studied creative writing or learned any of these specific narrative techniques so I just don't really know any of them I just write based on instinct which is an incredibly annoying thing to hear from an author which is why I just don't it's like when people say like oh it just poured out of me and it's like wildly unhelpful advice like it's probably true for that author but it just doesn't help anyone um in terms of world building um I normally start there's two basic techniques for world building I read about once so you either start from the top down or the bottom up and um, with bottom up you start from like small details and then work your way to bigger ones or you do it the other way around and you think of big stuff like cosmology and government and then work your way right down to tiny details um for me it's a sort of a combination of that like I sketch out enough of a world to to put a character in it and then I allow the character to become the engine of my world building so I'll I don't know I might create a street in my head for example and I just put the character on the street and I'll be like, okay, what are they seeing? What are they smelling? What are they hearing? And you start to create a picture just from those small details. Um, so she might see, uh, I don't know, a market stall. Okay, what are they selling at the market stall? What does what they're saying, what, what they're selling say about what this country is like? Like, you know, are they getting those products from somewhere else? And basically with world building, I ask myself questions. Like I'll, I'll put a link up at some point. I did these three Instagram posts with some example questions I asked myself. And I just keep asking myself questions. Okay, so if I have a desert country, for example, where are they getting water? How are they, you know, where are they getting it from? Like, is it coming from, I don't know, groundwater sources? Are they distilling it? Um, I might ask myself like, what are they wearing? Okay, what are they, what are they eating? What does that say about the agriculture? So I just keep asking myself questions and half of this stuff probably won't end up in the book because you don't want to just be randomly talking about agriculture unless it has some kind of bearing on the plot. But that is fundamentally how I will build. I, I just ask myself questions and often I have to do research um, because uh, the Priory Wells, for example, are they're not exactly, I, there's a note at the beginning of the book to say that they're not meant to be exact reflections of any real world country, but there's certain countries I use as what I call touchstones. So they give me a sort of a reference for things like food and clothing and history, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of that, I have like layers of research I do. So I do 
I, I would never say to anyone only use Wiktionary as a reference, but I will say that it's okay to use some kind of online encyclopedia just as a starting point I normally do, because it gives you a good overview of something. And then you can take specific things and look at them in more detail. So you can cross reference them, you can double check them in like, you know, proper books and that kind of thing. Um, the British Library was really helpful for me in doing that because a lot of academic books are very expensive, they're like a hundred pounds ago. Um, so I would, I'll look up, things like history and legend preferably written by someone who's actually from that place um, and then I'll do museums and uh, galleries that kind of thing and where possible I like to actually go to the place and look around as well if I, if I possibly can so yeah it's basically questions and layering is very important for me in world building as well in terms of I don't just want to know what this world is like now I want to have the sense of what this world used to be like and how it's changed and how it might look in the future. So sometimes I think you can read a fantasy book and it very much feels like the world has been created just for that character and their story. And it feels like the world is being built around them. Whereas I like to give a sense of, yeah, just a sense of layering, a sense that this world has always been there and that the character is just walking in one time period of it. So I'll, I'll add things about, you know, old architecture or crumbling ruins or that kind of thing. It just gives more of a, a rich and layered sense for me. That is so interesting to hear. Um, I love the, like how you're describing, take the character, put them on a street and see what they do. And mm -hmm. your mind can go in so many different places when you're imagining that. So like following all those different ideas is, oh, that's incredible. Um, so we're at the rapid fire round. Um, so just like first thing that comes to mind or, um, you know, just like really quick answers to these ones. What are you currently reading? Nothing, <laughs> because, I, because I just finished a book, um, which is called Tender Morsels by Margot Lanigan. Um, I will just give it a massive, massive content warning. It's a very, very dark book that deals with some very difficult issues, but I thought it was absolutely magnificent. It's very surreal and dreamlike and beautiful, beautiful writing stuff. Okay, amazing. Uh, did you take up an unusual quarantine activity? For me, it was Animal Crossing, knitting, and uh, also the book club. Um, um, I tried to do yoga for three days, and I decided that I wasn't bendy, so I just didn't <laughs> continue. <laughs> I, just, I just, I don't know how people get good at yoga. <laughs> I also tried that, um, didn't work out. Uh, favorite feminist retelling, like a Circe Madeline Miller. Oh, oh gosh, so many. Um, the one that's just instantly sprung to my head because it's a quick fire round is called um, Damsel by Eleanor K. Arnold, which is actually kind of also a George and the Dragon retelling, but it's like a general damsel dragon type thing. And uh, it's very good and very dark. And there's one scene that made me properly go, oh, oh my God, um, it was a lot. Um, but yeah, it's good. Amazing. And then famous feminist response to literature, like a wide sargasso sea. Oh, goodness. Um, I've never actually read White Sargasso Sea, which is terrible. Um, yeah, no, I, sorry, I've, I've literally gone completely blank. Oh, actually, um, I really like Margaret Atwood's The Penelope Ad. I, I enjoyed that a lot. It was like a retelling of like Odysseus, um, but from Penelope's perspective, it was really good. I haven't read that one yet, but I love feminist retellings of Greek mythology. That's like my genre and oh, that yeah. one is getting recommended to me. So it's on my to purchase list. It's very um, short as well. So you could probably read it in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, if you could have anyone, if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Emily Dickinson. Hilariously, I actually had um, dinner once with someone who said that they were a relative of Emily Dickinson. And I was like, oh my God, I'm sitting in the presence of her spirit somehow. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. She is with us. <laughs> yeah, I felt, I felt that deeply. Um, yeah, I just, I love Emily Dickinson. Like, I'm not really a massive poetry person generally, um, but I, I remember when I read her poems um, before, just before I went to university and it's the only She's the only poet where I feel like I can connect to every single poem that I read. I can just open one of her connect collections and just every single time find something that speaks to me. Oh, I love that. Um, favorite class you took at university? Um, oh, we, oh God, it's, it's been so long. <laughs> we did, um, we, so it, we did like, um, it's a very sort of wide ranging course at Oxford, like you do English literature from old English right the way up to the modern day. Um, Actually, I love my Emily Dickinson classes um, because I nobody else in the year did Emily Dickinson. So it 
was just me and a tutor talking very deeply. Um, but I also really liked my classes on Old English because it made me feel really smart when I could pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, so I saw on your Instagram story the other day that Sab is actually 6'1", which, she is. wow, wow. Um, can you share another fun fact or trait about a character in Priory that readers wouldn't know? Oh gosh, um, I honestly think I've said half of them. Um, yeah, the, the tallness thing was funny because I, I'm really tall and I think people just, they normally assume characters are much shorter. Um, but yeah, for me, I just sort of default to characters being really tall. So, um, oh my God, what, like, I actually don't know. I've gone completely blank. Um, I honestly think I mentioned like half of the interesting facts about them in the book. I might have to come back to you on that. <laughs> Right. You can, we can pick it back up later in the conversation. Um, and then I have three more favorite queer movie. Um, oh my God. Have I even seen that many queer, queer movies? I don't think I have. Like I, I haven't seen any of like the, the, the sort of more recent famous ones. Mine is I, The Handmaiden. Have you seen that one? No, I really want to see that because that sounds amazing. It's based on Sarah Waters' book, isn't it? I don't know. I think it's based on Fingersmith, I'm pretty sure. Oh, um, yes. Yes, people are saying yes in the comments. I was like, I must have seen a queer movie, surely. Surely I've seen surely. one. I can, I, can, I can name a TV show I've seen instead. Yeah, um, I've, that, was um, my, that was my next one. Yeah, Sense8, which I think is super underrated. Um, it's by the Wachowski sisters. And it's a massive, mass. they only did two seasons of it because it cost so much money to make. Like they were actually filming like on set in multiple different countries, but it's basically about eight people who become psychically connected to one another. And it's so queer. I mean, it's like various, it, it's not perfect. Like I could criticize a few things about it. Like there's a few kind of slightly stereotypical storylines for the characters of color and that kind of thing. So it's not perfect, but it is a, a brilliant show in terms of queerness. It just really celebrates queerness and like basically pretty much all of the main characters just are queer in some way it's great I have never seen that show actually I, I do need to watch it but I remember the internet just like went berserk when it got cancelled oh it yeah was I, was, so I, was, I was devastated when it got cancelled just it felt like something genuinely new and unique and interesting and I, I sort of knew it was doomed to failure for that exact reason but it, it was great they did like a final hour-long finale episode which I really appreciated so um, actually, it's maybe it's two hours. I think it was like a feature film length finale. So that was good. Um, and my last question is favorite musical artist that you're listening to right now? Um, I listen to mostly musical artists that are like trailer music at the moment because I'm writing an epic fantasy. So I'm listening to a lot of um, Two Steps from Hell, which does like kind of dramatic, epic type music. Um, no, I, I can't really listen to music with lyrics when I'm writing. So yeah, Two Steps from Hell is kind of my, my thing right now. <laughs> I follow your Spotify playlist for Prior of the Orange Tree, and that's all I listen to when I read now. And our oh, really? book for August is She Who Became the Sun, which I'll call Oh, it's so good. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw you were quoted on the American cover at the bottom, and yeah. I was like, oh, instantly, we have to pitch this for Safflet. Um, yeah. But I there was one book that I was reading, and there's this really dramatic song in it that builds up into like this epic instrumental part and it was during a very dramatic battle scene and everything <laughs> lining up perfectly I was as I was reading it so thank you for creating that um okay and now we're moving on to community questions so for everyone on the call we're going to have a little uh chat Q&A at the end these are ones that were proposed um in our Geneva post discussion room so if you have any questions for Samantha pop them in the chat um but these were already proposed so everyone was kind of confused with Tane's last uh, POV chapter. Why was she bleeding from her side? I have to ask. I, I can't tell you that. Like even, even my editor didn't know, like literally my, just as we were about to send it to print, my US editor, I, I don't generally do a lot of editing with the US, I get edited in the UK. Um, but my US editor was like, oh, wow, just um, just read the end of Priory. Yeah, great, great work. Um, what the hell was going on with Tane? And I was like, I can't tell you that. It's a little loose end for a sequel. <laughs> if I like, I would like to write a sequel at some point. I want to write prequels first, but um, I just, I, I was, I knew it would drive people crazy, but I just thought I'd put it in anyway. So you're not supposed to know why she was bleeding, but she's fine. A lot of people were like, is Tane dead? And I was like, no, 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 she's, she's fine. She's not dead. She's just bleeding a little bit. <laughs> so the thought that Safflet had was, um, the gem was sewn back into her side. So oh, you don't have to say if that's right or not, but that was like the, the proposed theory um, in our group. Got it. 
Um, so Maria wants to know if you could write a short story or novella focusing on the character of Kit, what would you write about? Oh man, I'd love to do just his adventures with loss at court because I can just picture them being this like weird, hilarious duo. Like they just, they just make such a fun team in my head. Like I love writing the sort of initial adventure scenes with them before everything went horribly wrong. Um, but yeah, like I like him, Kit has a sort of an interesting relationship with his family as well. Like his father's like very much his opposite. Like he's quite cruel and strict, whereas Kit is much more like fun and kind and like he loves poetry and that kind of thing. So I think that would be interesting to explore like Kit and his horrible dad and how Loth, Loth kind of helped him to, to break free of his dad's way of thinking and to become more the person he is. So that'd be fun. That's beautiful. Um, so Veronica, who you met at the beginning, wants to know um, your thought process surrounding Aubrex's Aubrex character. Yeah. So she says that it felt like we didn't really get to know him as a character. And he felt like, I mean, from my perspective, he was just like too perfect in, yeah. in a sus <laughs> suspicious way because no man is like that. Um, <laughs> so did he have good intentions? I, th I think he did. Um, may I think that his character slightly suffered the, the standalone thing because I kind of had to yeet him quite quickly um, because Eid needed to do her thing. <laughs> so I needed to just kind of get rid of Obrecht. But um, he, I, I liked him a lot. Like, I don't think he was a perfect person, but you just don't really see enough of him to... To, to necessarily get to know him, like you said, but I, I do think he meant well, like he, he had a sort of um, religious devotion to Sabran, which is an interesting thing. I think Roslyn, Sabran's lady, has this as well, where it's kind of difficult to, to separate the religious kind of devotion they have towards her from their actual feelings towards her. Like Ros, Ros I think, almost loves her in it, almost like a, a semi-romantic way, but it's so tangled up with her like deep religious sense and Sabran is this religious figure. Um, and, you know, Albrecht's in this position where he has to make a good marriage because you don't hear a lot about it, but you will in a prequel. But um, Mentenden, his country, was uh, conquered by a clan from Hroth for quite a long time and their country was left slightly weak after that. So he's kind of desperately trying to make a really good political marriage. Um, so, yeah, I think I think he did mean well, um, but it just wasn't really you know, an ideal circumstance to, you know, Sabrin didn't really want to be married to him. She doesn't want to be married at all, but then she kind of likes him because he turns out to be a nice guy, but she still doesn't want to be in the marriage and she doesn't want to have a child. And I think for Sabrin, it was very much, it, she, she wanted to like him, but she's so afraid of, you know, the childbirth that he was almost like a threat to her because of that. Like, even as he was, you know, the person she was supposed to be in love with, she was also kind of scared of him for that reason. So I, I like exploring, you know, weird, complex relationships like that, where there's a lot of facets to them. Yeah, when I was reading it, I thought Sab's love for him was really rooted in um, the way that he would fulfill her destiny of mm -hmm. having a child and like be the one who sealed her fate. Um, like the loss of him and the child, like all at once was like, her fate was just like thrown out the window. Yeah. Um, so that was my perception of him as like, did she love him for him or love him for fulfilling her duty? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I like readers to ask those kind of questions. Cause I just, yeah, well, that's, I, sometimes I don't want to necessarily explain it clearly. I like seeing how readers interpret things for themselves. Yeah. Um, Haley asks, is there anything you would change about the overall story now that you've had time to sit with it? Um, if you could go back, would you change anything? Um, I, there's a few, yeah, not, not that much. Um, I would like to make it more diverse in terms of, I don't think it, it doesn't really acknowledge, um, anyone outside the gender binary, which I regret because I just didn't really know that I just didn't know enough at the time about how to approach that and how to write that. Um, so in the next book, I've included like genderqueer and trans characters. So I, but you know, you're, you're constantly growing when you write books um, and you're constantly learning. So that's, that, that is something I, I regret about the first one. Um, other than that, not really. Like with my debut, I would 100% go back and change a bunch of things because I was literally 19 when I wrote it. So I, and I'm now nearly 30. So it, there's definitely like a list of stuff I would change. But priory, I was, I was pretty happy with it. I, I don't think there's a, a great deal I would change. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and then Libby has two really great questions. So she says that nature plays a massive role in the Priory world. What did you hope to represent about nature and its relationship to humanity? 
Yeah, this is something I've really loved exploring in the prequel, actually, because I, I think I was still I was still kind of figuring out the magic system when I wrote Priory. And now I'm much more confident in it. And I've gone much more into the kind of geology behind the magic and how the because the, the, you know it is, it is kind of based on a fairly simple concept of you know opposites and above and below and the stars and the fire um but I've really enjoyed exploring like the kind of the, the volcanic elements of it and the, the you know because literally the, the dragon the nameless one was born from a volcano um and born from an imbalance in nature and it's been really fun like explore that because this is why I ended up wanting to turn it into no, it's not. It's probably not going to be a series in the traditional sense, but I want to write more installments in the world. And each time you learn a little bit more about the kind of overarching magic system and what's gone wrong and how it can be fixed. Um, I guess it, I don't want to say it's like, oh, it's a commentary on global warming, because I think it risks becoming slightly preachy if you approach it like that. But it is kind of about what happens when, you know, the what happens when nature goes wrong and when something is thrown out of balance um so yeah I'm looking forward to exploring more of that it's been really fun like the next one is full of like all kinds of volcanic geology like hot springs and volcanoes and just it was really fun like I've I've learned a lot about how cool our planet is while I was researching it oh that's so exciting I cannot wait to read it um and then Libby's last question was if you could do a retelling of another story like you did with Saint George and the Dragon what would it be and why Mm, I'm not going to tell you that because I've got an idea and I want to publish it. So, <laughs> all right, we will wait. Um, and then, yeah. So you mentioned that you're writing uh, and currently editing a prequel to Priory. So, um, Veronica and I have been stalking your Tumblr, and we have, like <laughs> getting all those little clues from um, you answering audience questions. So. Is there anything that you can share a little bit more about that? Um, any like insider details? Um, just tell us what you can and what you want. Yeah, I can't say a lot. I don't think I was ever actually allowed to say that it was a prequel, but it just sort of slipped out at some point and now I'm stuck with that. <laughs> I probably, I don't think my, my publisher even realizes I have Tumblr. So it probably just came out on Tumblr at some point. <laughs> but I know, I know people were really wanted to know what I was working on. So I just ended up saying it was a prequel, which it is. Um, but formally, I'm not allowed to say anything, but I, uh, I wanted to say that it was a prequel because I didn't want people thinking it was a sequel. Like I didn't mm -hmm. want, I, I didn't want people to like get really hyped for like more Eden Sabra and it doesn't turn out to be them. Um, they are unfortunately not alive at this point, <laughs> so it can't, it literally can't follow them. Um, but there are some cameos from a couple of characters, you know, who are able to cross time periods. Um, they, it follows different narrators. Um, it has four main narrators like Priory does. And then it has four, what I call satellite narrators who just tell little bits of the story. Um, so, you yeah, know, it, it has a lot more, um, I think the currently the balance is that the narrators are seven women and one man. <laughs> so it's like slightly less um, balanced than Priory was in that respect. What can I say? I love women. Um, it is. It's kind of like Priory, like it's it's kind of like Priory ramped up, like there's more dragons, there's like there's more queerness, like it is, it's like hopefully everything you liked about Priory like multiplied several times. So yeah, it's I'm enjoying it a lot. I also have to hand in the second draft next week and I thought I didn't have to hand in the second draft until October, so now I'm really panicking. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you can definitely do it. That's so exciting. Um, I'm yeah, that's another thing that uh, all staff lit people just so you know, when it comes out, we're reading it, there's not going to be a poll. I'm just like having an executive presidential order here. Sorry, <laughs> one. Um, yeah, we were talking about like what we would want in a sequel and the thing that I think I mean, you don't have to do anything with it, but I'm just saying the thing that I would want most in a sequel is the letters between Eden Sabrin and the Ten. Oh, yeah. I just like, I want to relish in that gay love so much more and yeah. uh, adored their story so much. So that is something that I've been thinking about a lot. I'm sure I would, I'm sure I could write that at some point, like the letters of Eden Sabrin. Like I picture um, uh, Eve's little bird friend, Sarsoon. I picture him carrying the letters back and forth <laughs> between them. I think that'd be really sweet. Um, and then my last question. So earlier I mentioned um, our book for August is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan, and you're quoted on the bottom cover. So an announcement to everyone on the call, I will actually be interviewing so Shelley Parker Chan. Um, this week of September, she agreed to chat with us just like we're chatting with you now, like little old me 
this book club three months ago is pinching herself that we get to talk to authors like you. It's so exciting. So thank you to everyone on the call for making conversations like this possible. Um, no sports, but anything I absolutely need to ask her. Oh my god, um, I. I, I would get slightly overwhelmed if I was uh, if I was talking to I just think it was it's such a, a brilliant brilliant book um I don't know like I'd love to, to know the historical research Shelley did because it is obviously it's set in uh, medieval China um, at the twilight of the Yuan dynasty um so that would be just fascinating to know what kind of research went into it but it's it's a fantastic book I really really loved it some of the debuts this year have been incredibly impressive yeah well, you are so welcome to join the Zoom discussion. I will, I will. <laughs> read along to Philippa for you. Um, and okay, so we are now opening to chat questions. Um, so I'm just opening the chat and I'm gonna scan. Um, Maria asks, does Samantha have an idea for who would voice um, the dragon whose name I cannot pronounce, Naeem Mathun, um, mm. if the book were made into an animated feature or live action film? Like how do you, who do you imagine doing her voice? Oh, wow. Um, I've never, ever thought about voice actors, actually, not once. Um, I'm not sure, like, because I, I picture the dragons, like, I always have a very distinct sense of, I don't know how a human being would create the sound, I imagine, because the, the sort of the, the worms, the, the earth fire dragons, I imagine as having voices almost like rock grinding together, like quite an unpleasant sound to listen to. So just like very kind of deep and just scary um and then the the dragons I imagine as having sort of very resonant sort of echoey voices so I'm not I'm not sure who could do that actually that's a really interesting question <laughs> um the first time like the first time I heard the dragons talk I went to our little Geneva chat and I was like the dragons fucking talk yeah, they talk like, like I it's, like, it's really interesting that so many authors don't do talking dragons now like in Game of Thrones but when I was a kid like the first dragon thing I saw was Dragonheart um oh, which no. if you haven't seen it the best like cute funny dragon movie and it's got like Sean Connery voicing a dragon <laughs> and so I just imagined dragons as having a Scottish accent when I was a kid and I it, there was like no question for me that I was going to do talking dragons 100%. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Wilma asked, what were your inspirations behind the food in Priory? I got so hungry reading the descriptions of so many dishes, LMAO. <laughs> I, I do like writing food descriptions. Um, I'm not like, I just looked, uh, I really enjoy looking at sort of what's in season at any one time, because when you're thinking about, you know, medieval Elizabethan times, you have to think about what could be on the table because they don't have like, you know, refrigerators, they, they don't have the ability to grow the same food all year round. Like, you know, we can just grab like some tomatoes or apples whenever we want, but in terms of priories, well, they have to think about, you know, okay, it's autumn, what can be on the table? And I looked up some sort of Elizabethan recipes and that kind of thing, but I, I do really enjoy writing about food. I try not to go too over the top because I don't want to just like go on for like three paragraphs about this one pie, but it is, it is kind of fun. And it, it can indicate things about the world. Like, I think, I know that George R. R. Martin does kind of get made fun of for the huge food descriptions, but I think there is a purpose to them, like to show that, you know, these characters are incredibly wealthy and can have all this food whenever they want while people are starving. So you can make, you know, commentary on stuff with food descriptions. Absolutely, yeah. No, he would go on for like a page, like a full page yeah. describing like one dish. Yeah, <laughs> which, which is great. He's very good at it. It makes me hungry. Very good at it. <laughs> Um, Haley wants to know how far back do you think you're going in the prequels? Um, so I, I'm not going to say which time period I'm exploring in this prequel because people immediately guess what it's about. Um, but I would like to go quite a long way back um, because I picture the thing that went wrong in the world of Priory, which a couple of things have gone wrong to create the current chaos. But I, I picture like a good thousand years or before before the main storyline and I, I just love I love the challenge of creating the same world and the same countries but again showing them at different time periods and how they're you know how is this version of Innis or Seiki different to the Priory version and it's been really fun doing that and just thinking about you know how would the the language be different how would the food be different how just how the clothing different all that kind of thing it's, it's really good fun. Amazing. Sarah wants to know what your favorite Emily Dickinson poem is. I don't think I could choose a favorite. I, I really genuinely, like I said, whenever I go through her collections, I just, I, there's always one that I love. Um, so no, I, I don't think I would choose a favorite. Um, 
Jenny wants to know, do you have a favorite fictional character outside the ones in your books? I do, but I always have so many. Um, I, I really like Lainey Taylor's characters a lot. Um, I really liked, um, I don't know if you've read Strange the Dreamer, but I really like the character of, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but Sarai, um, who's like a, she's a character who can, she's called the muse of nightmares and she can like create nightmares and she sort of like, she has this power where she like sort of vomits moths out of her mouth and then like moths can just go and land on people and she can like affect their dreams. It's really interesting. I just, I just love all of Lainey's books. They're beautiful. I've never read any of them. I'll have to check that what? one out. What? Oh God, please. No. please. She's, she's an absolute genius. I always learn new words from her books as well. I'm a, I'm a word enthusiast. I love etymology and it's, uh, I always learn new words from her books. New words from Priory. I was like Googling. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few like Elizabethan words in there. And I, I'm, I really like looking at different words in them that obviously we have a lot of dialects here in the UK and I really like using dialectal words from different regions. So that was fun. Um, Shea is asking how the dragon riders breathe in the water when the dragons submerge. Do they just hold their breath? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, the dragons, I mean, they can train themselves to hold their breath for quite a while. Interestingly, the thing I've been exploring in the prequel is um, how they breathe when they're flying. Because if you think about the effects of altitude on the human body, like when people climb Everest and stuff, like all kinds of crazy effects can happen from altitude because the human body just isn't meant to survive that high up. And I was thinking like, yeah, like in dragon riding, you always just see people casually flying, but if they're flying really high, that's gonna have some serious effects. It's very cold, it's very difficult to breathe and thinner so I've done like all of this stuff where they like eat ginger to kind of you know offset the effects of altitude sickness and that kind of thing so it has been and there's a scene in Priory actually um where Tane climbs uh, she remembers climbing this mountain and it's like a challenge that was set to the dragon riders because it's this incredibly high mountain and she's like the only person who manages to reach the top um, and it just showed you know how determined she is so that's yeah, the underwater is basically just hoping that the dragon remembers that the human needs to breathe. <laughs> um, they, I feel like the dragons, by the time of Priory, they've been sort of tamed, not exactly tamed, but they've, they've interacted with humans enough to understand that humans have needs like that. But in the, the prequel I'm writing, I'm writing them as slightly more wild and untamed, so they sometimes slightly forget that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so interesting. Um, Val asks, what's your favorite book? And if you had to recommend a book for your whole life, what would it be? Oh, yeah, interesting there. I, hmm. uh, I would say one of my favorite books is definitely The Handmaid's Tale, because that introduced me to feminism and to dystopian fiction. I also really like The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book. Um, and it's, it's one of the, those books that I'm like, wow, I literally haven't ever read anything like this before. Like normally in fantasy, you're very much like, oh, this feels a bit like this. Um, but The Fifth Season is just like, it's something completely unique and fascinating. And it's just beautiful in terms of world building, characterization. I, it's one of those books I just literally couldn't criticize. <laughs> yeah. Those are two books that I haven't read. Um, you haven't read The Handmaid's Tale? I know, I know. I, so I was introduced to the show and it ended up being really triggering for me. So I oh, to, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I had to pause that, but then I bought the book and that is going to be something that I tackled this year. Um, but my therapist yelled at me this week because she was like, you haven't read fucking N.K. Jemisin? And her... Yeah, her husband is like a massive like fantasy sci-fi writer and she recommended like her iconic trilogy to me. So that is my homework now for therapy to read that. Oh, yeah, um, she's, she's like, she once answered one of my tweets and I fully went like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, that's how I felt when you answered to do this talk. So like fangirl moment. <laughs> like, no, she, she's the queen. Um, but yeah, no, the Handmaid's Tale, like, I, I agree with the show. Like even though I'd read the book, I, I find the show massively difficult to watch. I, I think it's brilliantly acted, but oh my God, it's so, it's, it's like seeing my worst fear on screen. So it took me so long to get through even one season of it. I haven't watched the, the most recent season yet because I very yeah. much have to, be, I have to be in the right mindset that I know I can cope with it. So I, I know I totally get it, but the book is kind of a bit easier because I feel like it's told in a slightly more surreal style. Like it's quite different when you're actually seeing it. It's like harder to distance exactly. yourself from it. Yeah. Um... Claudia asks, the Emperor of the Twelve Lakes mentions a sea maiden when he's talking to Loth about a mysterious love. Is he talking about the Golden Empress? I'm not going to say, but I will say that I think that people, the Golden Empress is quite a lot older than him, um, which is, you know, it's 
I, just something I'm saying is they, they're not, I think some people think that they're a more similar age than they are. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, I'm not going to say because I would like people to guess who it is. I think you have enough information to know who it is. Um, so yeah, uh, that's all I'm saying. Amazing. Um, Lila is asking how you went about your research. You spoke about world building and gathering research um, and like deciding what to use. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, that is the one challenge with research that once you find out something cool, you want to use it and you have to really be strict with yourself about like what you're going to use. Um, I remember once there's this one moment where I think the, the Golden Empress is mentioned as wearing a hat made of otter fur. I swear to God, I spent like five days trying to find out what kind of fur they used in this certain historical period in a certain country just to write that one goddamn sentence about her wearing an otter fur hat. <laughs> I was like, I can't even explain how much time that took. And it amounted to one sentence in the book. Um, but yeah, I'm very, I was very committed to finding out what would be a historically accurate type of hat. And again, it's so silly where we think about historical accuracy. Like, why was I so concerned about this damn hat when there's a dragon over there? Like, what? <laughs> But yeah, the no, that's the I, kind of weird stuff I fixate on, apparently. Um, but yeah, like I just I love looking up like I have to do, like I said, it's a very layered process. And in terms of priory, I have to do lots of different types of research. So there's the geographical re and geological research, which I do tons of. I've done so much research on stuff like salt flats and hot springs and stuff this year. Um, clothes research, food research, like all of it takes time um, and yeah, just, it's stuff like constructing governments. Um, it's interesting when you're drawing from history because when I'm drawing things into a fantastical setting, I have to be thinking about, you know, what can I take over from the real world? Why am I taking that specific thing? Would that make sense in my fantasy world? Um, so that requires a certain degree of negotiation as well. It's a, it's a very, there's many facets to the process of research for me. Amazing. Um, and then Hannah wants to know, who do you see acting as your main characters if Priory were to become a TV or film adaptation? I went the Tumblr 2012 fan casting route of picturing Adelaide Kane as Sab. Oh, really? <laughs> I just cannot see anyone else. She's just like her rain photos. I just was like, that's Sab. Um, and oh, now I can that out of my mind. But who do you see as the characters? I can see why you choose Adelaide, but because I've watched Rain, I would always picture her as Mary. That's the problem. Like mm -hmm. I, she would always be Mary Queen of Scots in my yeah. head. Um, <laughs> I've, I, I, I never even want to say who replaced that because I think that there is a very strong uh, subsector of Priory fans who really, really want it to be Katie McGrath. And if I say anything else, <laughs> I'm, I'm in danger. This <laughs> so, is <a> safe space. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's, I, I, I think she's, I think she's great. I mean, she, she's older than how I imagine Sab. But I mean, if they aged up the characters or whatever, that would, I mean, I can certainly, I can see why people picture her as that brand. I'm not really that strong on fan casting. Like I sometimes prefer not to fan cast because I think it can affect how people imagine the characters. Um, and so I, I tend towards not giving my my fan cards because I just I like people to be able to picture the characters for themselves. So fair. And then I'm scrolling through the questions. Ba, 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 ba. Um, oh, you are fantastic at writing history. I would love to see how the world would be different in the history. Oh, that's not a question. Um, <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Haley wants to know, you originally called Priory a standalone. Can you describe the moment you realized it needed more? This is funny because um, when I went to my agent originally and I, I gave him like the first part of the manuscript just to see what he thought of it. And um, he was like, I was like, oh, it's definitely going to be a standalone. And he burst out laughing, like right in my face. <laughs> And I said, what are you laughing at? And he was like, this is the girl who decided at the age of 19 that she was going to write a seven book series. And you seriously expect me to believe that this is standalone. I was like, it is a standalone. I can, I can write a standalone. I can walk away from a world. I'm fine. Um, but then I was like, well, I think it was when I was creating like the backstory and I was talking about like the, the characters like Caliber and Neporo. And I was like thinking about them and Cleoland as well. And I was like, oh, now I've spent all this time building this world, you know, do I really want to leave it? And I just didn't want to. There was, I just realized there was so much more to it that I could do. And I was just really excited about it. So I, I don't, I'm not sure when exactly I had the realization. Um, I guess it was probably just when I was about halfway through it or something. But when I told my agent, he was like, huh, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
I think the mark of a like really, really good book is when you close it and you're done and you know, you're going to miss the characters yeah, and miss their voices in your head. And that's how I felt about Priory. Um, so I'm very happy that the world is still in your head and is going to live on. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I would definitely like to return to the original cast at some point, but I thought it would be more fun if we sort of learn a bunch of stuff in the prequels that becomes important in the sequel or something like that. Just And then I can return to those characters as a way to finish it off, maybe. So just it would be like, I would call it kind of more of a cycle than a series, because I think a series implies that you need to read them all. I, I would just like you to be able to pick them up individually. So when, pe when, when people see the prequel, they, they don't necessarily have had to have read Priory to understand it. So. Yeah, no, I love, I love calling it a cycle. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, Megan wants to hear more about creating Kaliba's character and her connection to Sabrin. Was that planned from the beginning? That was interesting because basically she is a, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the George and the Dragon legend that I, I didn't even know when I was young, like the orange tree actually comes from the legend, for example. Okay. Um, and the character of um, Calibur, she's, she features in like various versions of it and she, she has various roles, like sometimes she's the sort of uh, creepy, slightly incestuous character and then other times she just, she's kind of more mild and she just gives George his sword but I found it fascinating that she she actually created or gave him the sword that he uses to kill the dragon and then she completely vanishes from later versions of the legend like I hadn't even heard of her before um so I found that really interesting and I thought okay well maybe I can explore this character and you know find some interesting way to sort of resurrect her and give her a story um and I'm hoping to make her character more complicated and to bring her back as the cycle goes on because I think you get quite a one-dimensional view of her in Priory and, and you're basically just seeing her from Eve's perspective um but I picture her being a very sort of complicated layered person who's been alive for a really long time and by the time you see her, she's quite divorced from her humanity because I really, I like, sometimes you, you see immortal characters in books and they just read like normal people. And I think immortality would have quite a weird effect on you. Like sometimes I read immortal characters and they're literally behaving like teenage boys. And for me, I'm like, when, if someone is immortal, they are going to, they're going to change. Like their personality is going to go a little bit sort of, you are going to become divorced from mortals and you are going to start thinking quite differently and being quite distant and cold, I would imagine, because you've lost every single person you've ever loved. Um, so by the time you see her, that's the person you're seeing. Um, but yeah, in terms of her relationship to Sabrin, I think, I think that came quite late, actually. Like, I, I knew that Sabrin was going to be descended from the St. George figure, Galleon. Um, but then when I worked Calibur in, I was kind of trying to think of a way to give her an important role in the story. And that's what it ended up being. I just thought it was kind of fascinating that she would just, she would secretly have been the real founder of the line of the House of Berethna. Um, so that was fun. Um, I love what you said about immortal characters acting like teenage boys because I'm like, this is Twilight, this is the Vampire Diaries, this right. is like Akatar, no shade. Um, but yeah, that's definitely very true. And yeah, Callie Bell was definitely so separated from her humanity in the end. Yeah, and I've, I've tried to do that in my other series as well because there are these immortal characters throughout and the, the love interest in that series is immortal and it's so, so interesting just trying to create a character who feels genuinely unlike a, a mortal human. It's, it's a really fun challenge for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then my last question is, the book starts with a quote from Revelation. At what point did you find that passage in your writing process? Um, well, so I was actually raised, um, I'm, I'm not religious now, but I was raised Christian. Um, like my grandparents were Christian. Um, I went to an Anglican church up until I was about maybe 16. Um, so the, the Bible is kind of very embedded in my, my the framework of sort of theological framework I have. Um, and Revelation was one that I actually found one of my childhood diaries and it had like illustrations from Revelation in it, I guess. I was like 10 like what was I what was I doing um so it, it has a it's it when I saw that line about the abyss and the angel coming out of heaven and the dragon specifically because the the dragon um is a, a sort of an ancient symbol of you know the devil or some evil force and I thought that would be an interesting because the book is so much about religion 
and because St George is so tied to Christianity as well a lot of it is about exploring religion and the six virtues is kind of analogous to Christianity in some ways so when I saw that quote I was like yeah that's that feels like a good one to have at the beginning also the earliest inspiration for Priory was kind of arguably when I was when I was at school we used to sing hymns obviously because it was a Christian school and um, we, there was this one hymn called When a Knight Won His Spurs. And it's basically about a very brave knight who's like a warrior for God and he goes around killing dragons and ogres. Um, and it's all about how, how kind of great he is basically. And I used to really hate that song when I was a kid. Because, and I used, there's a line where it says, and the knights are no more and the dragons are dead. And I used to refuse to sing the line about the dragons being dead because I was so upset that this guy had killed all the dragons. <laughs> Um, so I, I give that as like my earliest inspiration for Priory because I just had this deep resentment towards the knight figure and I think that sort of came out <laughs> in, in the story of Galleon. <laughs> I love that fact. Um, I can just picture like defiant little Samantha being like, no, I'm not saying this. Um, I was furious, absolutely furious. Yeah. I also had a childhood obsession with dragons. There was this book in the US, it was called Dragonology. Mm -hmm. um, I and think I've heard of that, yeah. It is like to this day, one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. And it's just like a complete, this author's complete um, kind of guide to dragons and all the different breeds and all the different types. And I think I got that out of the public library like once a month for like a good two years. Oh, wow. um, and I was also raised um, Christian. So very much relating to the hymns and later defiance of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was my last question. Um, thank you so much. This oh, was having me. such an incredible discussion and I loved chatting with you. You're absolutely lovely. And I would love for you to come back when your next book is published and we are being forced to read it for Safflet. Um, <laughs> the mandated um, read, yes. <laughs> yes mandated read. Um, just <laughs> so for everyone, please prepare because I heard it's longer than Priory, but we can definitely do it. Um, I believe in us and yeah, just, I have no words. I'm speechless. Thank you so much. This, this meant a lot to me personally and, um, everyone in the group was so excited to have you here. So thank you for taking the time and I hope you have a lovely weekend and happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for having me. This has been a, such a lovely way to spend an afternoon and, uh, it's distracting me from my vaccine side effects. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um hydrate I when I got my second vax I was like hyped up on ibuprofen Gatorade and I like lay prone watching the great pottery for them <laughs> I'm gonna go and do that now pretty much but it's absolutely worth it um but yeah thank you so much for having me and I'm so so thrilled that you enjoyed Priory um and those were really great questions as well oh thank you so much um well thank you everyone for joining um we are gonna go fangirl in the Geneva chat now um so just so you know this is all recorded and I'm gonna put it in the Geneva group um but have a great day and goodbye everyone